the podcast. Uh, for next class period, read chapters one through six, Peopleware, and Webster number three. So I guess we're going to be talking about Webster number two here. Let me bring it up. I don't want to, I, mostly with this, just want to. Mostly, I'm, I'm trusting you guys are actually reading this stuff. So I just want to get any questions you have. First one, retain IT talent with goal alignment. Uh, this was something I did in pages that helped to keep the team pulled together. Actually, a lot of that, a lot of the helping to keep the team from flying apart. This is a great group of engineers, best group I've ever worked with. And we were just getting at each other's throats because we're under a lot of pressure. Uh, we had some unclear divisions of labor, some, you know, who's responsible for this. So and so doesn't know what he's doing. And I did an offsite, I took them all offsite. And we all just sat. It was, it was a nice, uh, it was at some sort of hotel with a nice outside patio. We had a big whiteboard, and I sat there and said, why are each of you here? What are your goals? We literally went and spent probably a good two hours having each of the engineers say, this is why I'm here. This, this is why I joined pages. This is what I hope to accomplish, and so on. We wrote them all down. Then I said, OK, given that, what goals can we set as a team that will help everyone to achieve their personal goals? And we spent about another hour are, you know, talking about that, coming up, and we came up with a list of team goals. I probably somewhere in my files still have photographs of the whiteboard. And then we said, okay, how can we shape our team and personal goals to actually help the company ship product? And what that led to was a situation where every engineer could see how helping the company succeed would meet her or his goals, personal goals. And we really had no team problems after that. One of the things I'm proud of, proud of is in five years at Pages, we never had any software engineer voluntarily. Turnover was effectively we had one we fired. Actually, there's one, one of my first hires I fired after a month. It just wasn't working out. We had another one we fired after a couple of years because he just had some significant personal problems and that was basically poisoning the whole development environment uh, uh, in terms of his, his constant criticism to everyone else and, and just some pretty weird behavior on his part. Uh, we had a couple who were let go and we, we cut, cut the size of the company year, four years in, and then the rest of us will stuck it out to the end. Uh, the problem, as I say, is that upper management tends to see engineers as interchangeable. Uh, it's kind of like, well, can't we just go hire some engineers and replace the ones we have? Uh, or they'll think that they can, they can use some rather crude management techniques. In pages, we had a situation where we this is after we missed our first deadline, we're trying to get things done. And we're actually probably about six months late at this point, approaching the end of the year. And the CEO and CFO were saying, well, you know, maybe we should set things up and let them know if we don't ship by the end of the year, you know, this is going to happen, these negative consequences. But if they do ship, we'll give them this. I, I talked to Larry and John said, these are engineers who have been working 70, 80 hours a week for a couple of years. He said, no threat, no reward is going to somehow magically make them more productive. We're all working on this stuff. And I actually had one of these software engineers who worded this got back and, and she stopped me in the hallway. And she said, don't they realize you're dealing with grown-ups? Huh, we're not kids. <laughs> you can't bribe us with ice cream. Uh, <laughs> threaten us with grounding. Uh, don't get rest. See more of it. Have any of you seen negatively or positively some of these issues as far as goal alignment and uh, uh, team cohesion? <laughs> no one wants to raise their hand. <laughs> okay, Conway's Law. Oh, yes. I didn't observe any answer to this question, actually. So, like with a company with a big company with like thousands of engineers and stuff like that, does like each team or manager do like? Do 
do something like this, or is this kind of that's pretty much on a, team, on a team level, and a lot of what we'll talk about reading people where is teams. Okay. Because software ultimately is built on teams. Sometimes big teams, but mostly relatively small teams. Uh, because I, and my rule of thumb is I would rather have a small group of really bright engineers than a big group of really bright engineers. Uh, because of the communications issue, because frankly it's ego issues, and there are ego issues. Uh, but simply because with a smaller group, it is easier to come to that mind mill of the, the specific requirements that were, you were saying that. Having the specific requirements and all understanding what everyone means by the same concept. Conway's Law. This is, this is the screensaver I was referring to. I was reviewing this IT project at a company that will remain nameless. It was supposed to take two years and cost $180 million. When they brought me in, they had been going for four years and had spent $500 million. And they wanted to know what's it going to take to get this into production. They didn't like my answer. Uh, but one of the first things I said is, who's the chief architect? Okay, no chief architect. I said, who's head of quality assurance? There's no head of quality assurance. I spent half a billion dollars. There's no chief architect and there's no head of quality assurance. Those are big red flags. I had a team of, of three people working with me. We spent three months going through everything. And this was the mental image I was building of their architecture. It was a nightmare. Because the systems were broken across divisions, different groups within each division, different divisions. And this is pretty much how they all talked to each other. Uh, it was an absolute nightmare. And here's, I mean, the kicker was that they had spent four years, $500 million, and they did not have any code ready for production. I came away professionally depressed. It's like, how can someone spend half a billion dollars and have nothing, nothing that they can actually use? So it went to a month ago. It went to a lot of high paid consultants. It went to, went to IBM, it went to AMS, uh, went to a lot of people who spent a lot of time thinking great thoughts and building crap. <laughs> Seriously. That's exactly where it went. Uh, Fred Brooks is one who coined Conway. Architecture tends to follow organization, therefore, and for the most part, I saw this in all your work charts. Your organization should reflect your anticipated architecture. Hint, if your architecture changes, change your organization. Because it's usually a lot easier to change your organization than it's to change your architecture. Uh, this, just read this. This is, this is, this is, uh, I think a worthwhile and important article. Uh, but this is more something just to tuck away in your mind for when you get out in the industry. Uh, because one of the problems you'll find with, you know, like I said, a lot of you are going to end up doing software maintenance. I've done that. I mean, it's like, here's this existing system, you know, add these features, fix these bugs. Uh, my argument here, this is an article I wrote for an online CIO magazine same kind of CIO magazine that's mocking, uh, is that it can be useful to have someone whose job is basically be chief architect for all existing systems to learn how they work so that when requests for feature changes come in, the person can say, oh, you don't want to do that. <laughs> or here is the best way to do that rather than uh, the comment I think just was Justin, someone back there was making about, you know, adapting new technologies and just patching it, patching it, patching it. Okay, that's what happens with making software. You get serious software rot setting in. Because it's like you do whatever it takes just to put that one requested feature in, regardless of how it impacts the stability and sustainability and changeability of the, make of the uh, system. Uh, Negotiations and love songs. Again, read this. It's a, it's a very short piece, but this is important to keep in mind. There are three basic groups in any organization. The people building it, the people marketing and selling it, and the end users who may be inside the organization or they may be the customers outside the organization. The disconnect between these three groups can be dramatic. It can be very dramatic. 
the, uh, as I said, the three groups have a, have a hard time with them. They use game theory in this article. They have a hard time agreeing what game they're playing, much less what victory looks like. Uh, one of the things you'll have to do is learn to speak to customers and learn to speak to people. And listen, hear what they're trying to say, and then do your best to shape them. Uh, management tends to have this and this is, this is broad generalization, but management tends to see developers as, oh, they're a bunch of prima donnas who just want to sit around and think great thoughts and build cool stuff and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, by golly, we're going we're gonna, to you know, put the iron to them and make them work and make them produce. And you know, it's, it's back to what I was talking about. You don't they realize we're adults. Uh, the, Part of what's important is learning how to talk to upper management and tell them why things are or are not feasible. That can be hard. Because particularly, particularly if you're dealing with marketing types whose livelihood depends upon sales for the next quarter. It's a major source of their income. Sometimes the only source of their income. Uh, I did a system failure project. A review of a system failure project involving a, a major international vendor. Uh, and part of what came out in the documentation was that the salesperson who had sold this software uh, to a large company uh, had presented a custom, uh, non-usable demo to the customer as actual functioning software and made the sale of about a million dollar uh, bonus for making that sale. The whole thing ended up litigation, and her software company ended up paying almost $200 million back to the customer. <laughs> so that's the sort of thing that can happen out there in the commercial software world. Uh, the, uh, you have perverse incentives. That's it. I know you're all anxious. No, it took a little longer than possible, but hey, we're still getting up an hour. Uh, requirements documents.